you very much. And so, Stefan, please. Yes, I share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is the scheduler we assigned by, by Gabriel. We'll start with uh, Jim, who introduced the Inquater Pro framework. And I Stefan, will... Stefan, Sorry? we see, we see uh, the video panels. You have to share another screen. You have to share the screen with your presentation. You are now seeing your Zoom meeting. Ah, oh, sorry. So, uh, I don't know where I am, actually. <laughs> okay, I stop with this one, okay. I think your first slide is uh, that one with the schedule of the presentation of the meeting. That one? It is running. Yeah. You have to put in presentation mode. Okay. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. So let's go. Now it's up to Jim. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jim McAlpin. I'm currently the president of Turpro. And I have some slides to explain to people who are new to Pod Today's, uh, where TerraPro uh, came from and where we're going. Um, since the first Pod Today's workshop in 2009, INQUA has always been the main sponsor of Pod Today's. And INQUA, Stefan, stands, as you know now, for International Union for Quaternary Research, founded in the 1920s and currently has about 3,000 members. Every four years, INQA holds a Congress. The last Congress was in Dublin in July of 2019, and there were 2,400 people there, including a lot of people involved in the PADA community. And the next uh, Congress will be in Rome in 2023. Next slide. Can we advance the slide? There we go. Um, the actual work of INQA is done by its five TERPRO, or the Terrestrial Processes Commission, is the one that oversees all work in neotectonics and earthquake geology. Uh, TERPRO has about 400 corresponding members, with half working in earthquake geology and half working in more traditional geomorphology. And a corresponding member is just someone who has gone to the INQA website, gone to the TERPRO page, and hit the join button and, you know, filled in the join button. Next. Next. There we go. Um, Pod -a days has, over the years, had about 600 different people That's attend one of its workshops. And so uh, this is much larger than the number of earthquake geologists that we have who are actually corresponding members of TERPRO. Uh, it would be nice if we could get the other 400 of these scientists to sign up for TERPRO. Uh, and it's, it doesn't cost any money and it's easily done on the INQUA website. Um, the funding for Potter Days has always come through uh, a subdivision of TERPRO called an international focus group. And these international focus groups uh, are groups of people with a common research interest who wish to network on that uh, research topic. Next. So, these international focus groups last four years, and they receive money from INQA to organize conferences, to organize field trips, and to organize training <laughs> sessions for early career researchers. 
So note that INQA doesn't actually fund field work or laboratory costs. Uh, we don't have enough money to do that, frankly. Uh, but we do something that the National Science Foundations don't do is we give money for putting together conferences and exchanging ideas. In this year, 2020, TURPRO had two international focus groups, one in earthquake geology and another one which covered all the other traditional areas of geomorphology. And our IFG in earthquake geology was entitled Terrestrial Processes Perturbed by Tectonics. And uh, Stefan is in charge of that, or he's one of the leaders. Next. Potidae sequencing. Potidae has been held every year since 2009 with two exceptions. And the first exception was the two year gap between pata number one and pata number two. Uh, but the other gap is the one that we're in now. Uh, the latest pot of days was in the summer of 2018. And we, we're now at two and a half years past that. And it's still going to be another year till we have the in-person meeting in pot of days uh, in, in Chile. So I was just thinking for a graduate student that started his program after the Greek pot of days in say September of 2018, he can go through, he or she could go through their entire program as a graduate student and never attend a pot of days because th they'll be finished before three and a half years is up. Next. Let's skip this one. This is ancient history at this point. I wanna uh, go to the next slide. So this present Zoom seminar and the just finished abstract volume are attempts to fill this three and a half year time gap in the POTA series. Has this enforced hiatus been good or bad? Well, actually at one time, POTA leaders, leaders were concerned that having the meeting every year was not only a lot of work for the unpaid volunteers who put on and organized the meeting, but uh, it was too soon for many researchers to have a new talk on a new subject uh, every 12 months to come up with something. Uh, so, you know, we didn't arrange this. We can't help it because of the COVID, uh, but it's good that we're having this current uh, webinar activity uh, to, so that we can keep talking to each other. Next. Well, the surprise in October, about a month and a half ago, was INQA decided to abolish the IFGs, even though they had just approved a whole slate of them, including TPPT, um, just a month and a half before. So, uh, Stefan, you, you may want to talk about this or may not, but we, we've got a workaround uh, that all of these former international focus groups are gonna become multi-year projects in 2021. And really nothing is going to change except the name. Next slide. So here's our outlook uh, for all of TURPRO in 2021 under the new funding scheme. Both of the international focus groups from 2020 the TPPT, which is the earthquake geology one, and Hype Day, which is the non-neotectonics one, they're going to continue through 2023 as multi-year projects. Uh, this is also going to happen for the project Edith, which is headed by Franz Livio and in Subria. And we have received a new proposal, uh, a single year proposal for just 2021 only, on low slip rate regions, it's called Lemon, and this was actually sent to us by some ECRs. So that is the situation as of right now. And with that, I will turn it back to Stefan. Okay, so I will just introduce the new TPPT multi-year project, which will be 
basically three PATA days meetings as it's planned now. Um, so this is the list of the, you see, do you see my pointer? Yeah. So this is the list of the three PATA days meetings that will hopefully will occur, will occur in the field and online, um, on live, I would say. So the first one will be next year in Chile and um, Gabriel and Gabriel will present this later on. Uh, so Chile is right there. I will introduce some slides about what we plan to do for the French one. So in two years. And then we have some slides from the Chinese team. Um, I don't know if there is some, someone from China to present the slides or is there someone? I received the, the slides today or yesterday and I don't know if there is someone, nobody. So I, I will, I will uh, discover the slides with you more or less. So I will have sl some slides about France and um, France is, so we are talking about what we call metropolitan France. So this is an area of low seismicity and very low strain rates. So you can see the uh, what we estimate to be the, the, let's say, the usual rate in uh, France, all over France. Uh, basically, the far field tectonics is dominated by the um, counterclockwise rotation of this microplate, which probably uh, transfers some strain and stress into the intraplate area. Uh, we have another tectonic environment in the Western Alps, and I will come back later on that. So it's an intraplate area, but we have several damaging earthquakes and active faults, let's say, which are usually very shallow. And this is a problem because it can lead to uh, damages, obviously. Um, so the we will deal with some cases in southeastern France. The first two uh, sites we think to introduce to you in the field trips are located in Provence and Ardèche, where there are historical earthquakes. And the venue of the conference all around will be in this area, which is a nice one because we have a lot of wine in this area. So probably we'll have some uh, extra geological uh, uh, trip as well. And the last one will be uh, occurring in the Western Alpine chain, which is not a contract contractional environment, but today it's more transtensional, let's say, extensional and strike slip motions, which are uh, controlled mainly by the counterclockwise rotation of this plate, the, the Adria plate. So the first place is the, in Provence, so very southern part of France. There was a big earthquake in the 1909, uh, so last century with uh, an intensity very, um, very strong, a lot of damages. And this was probably, this is a map of the, the, the damages. And this is very probably controlled, was controlled by, due to that, to that fault, which is that thrust you have a section on that thrust here on the right, and you see that this is a shallow one, and the earthquake is estimated to be very shallow as well. So we have, we have now a good um, estimation of the location of the fault trace, and some trenches were done in, in the past. So this is one in 2005, but next year, and in two years, we will have a project in this area where we will have trenches dug for the Patadays field trip. So we will have the chance to, to drive you to these areas, to this area to see the trenches. So in that trench in 2005, there were already several events which were uh, evidenced. But the problem in that, in that time is that we don't have any edge constraint and it's robust. Edge constraint. So the, the, the second uh, site where we plan to drive you is in Ardèche. So it's 
more to the north, it's always in a contractional area. There was an earthquake last year in, um, in, in this city of Leteil, and we had a lot of damages in a very uh, narrow area because it was a very shallow earthquake. Once again, it was less than one kilometer, one kilometer at depth. And this was imaged by INSAR, and this is due to the inversion of uh, an oligocene normal fault, which was oh, inverted to a uh, reverse fault. Okay, so this, this was checked in the field. This is one example of the scouts we can measure. So we, we have dug uh, several trenches in this area just after the, just in between the two lockdowns, actually, we have the more than 10 trenches. So this is the rupture in white. This is more or less five kilometers long. We have the trenches and we see that there is deformation in the quaternary. We don't have the edges yet, but in two years, I think we will know a little bit more about this events and we, we will discuss all these topics because we had damages and there was a big discussion in the community of the uh, role of this big quarry which is thought by some people to be the triggering uh, factor for this earthquake. And I come to the last part where we think to go in the field trip, during the field trip. So this is far further to the east and this is an area of seismicity. You see the black points, which are basic, basically the epicenters. And we are dealing with one of the uh, seismic, um, the most seismic area of the Alps, where there was, for example, this large, large for France also, eh? magnitude five earthquake, but very damaging because very shallow as well. And this is a transtensional area. You see the uh, mm -hmm. stress directions which are inverted from the mechan focal mechanism. You are on time, Stefan. Yeah. Okay. I will finish. <laughs> okay. So we, in this area, the, the Western Alps, we have a very nice uh, morphology. If the, the weather is nice, so it will be perfect. If we have this kind of weather, we can see the, clearly the fault running into, the, into this pass. Okay, and we will discuss some interactions possibly between tectonics and gravitational processes. We will have uh, guys that will, that are um, skilled to discuss these kind of things. So now I come to the, to the, the 2023 Pada days in China. So um, this will be held basically in Sichuan, as I could understand in this um, yes, uh definitely. i'm here okay so please comment yeah <laughs> yeah i'm so sorry because um i'm jaleo from sklgt because uh, um professor shame is supposed to get this present but and um, she actually is not feeling well well today so she might get a very terrible cold. So, so i'm presenting her to give a, a brief introduction okay so hello everybody and so maybe the 2020, 23rd, the PADA meeting will be held uh, in SKLGP. So I will give a brief introduction about the SKLGP. And the SKLGP is actually right now the um, world-class institute of China and the um, Chinese only national level laboratory focused on the geohazard prevention and engineering geology. So we right now we are equipped, equipped with the 270 seats auditory and also some meeting rooms. So um, next slide, please. And hi, Stefan. Yeah, did you see the next slide? Uh, I couldn't see, sorry. So maybe the next slide is about the, our field trip. Yeah, oh, okay, good, I see it. So our field trip will visit the Minjiang River. And, uh, and Minjiang is actually located in the eastern margin of the Tibetan Plateau. And so the reason we stuck here is because it is the most uh, seismically active region in the world. So the tectonic activity not only brings the earthquake, but also the, um, some like geohazards. 
Um, next slide, please. Sorry. So maybe you will see the um, our route for the field trip, right? Yeah. This is what I see on my screen. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't see. And so, so here we will see. Oh, yeah, I saw it. So that is our like draft tree, the root of our field trip. We will um, see the mega earthquake sites and also the mega landslides. And as well as because recently the Wenchuan earthquake and the Jiuzhaigou earthquake, we will visit all these places. So that is about my um, brief introduction about our field trip in 2023. I have other slides, but maybe we can, maybe if we are a bit late, do you have something else to tell us, Jessica? Uh, no, I think that's pretty much no. here because it's a draft route and we will modify later. Okay, so I stop sharing my screen and Gabriel, you can, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much to Jim, Stefan and, and Jessica for this presentation and we are going now to present some some slides regarding the next uh, Pata Days 2021 we hope uh, in northern Chile and so um, this is a, a, a first slide showing the climatic context of the Atacama Desert which is the most arid environment worldwide in which we have a almost null precipitation during most of the years uh, with uh, one millimeter per year or two millimeters per year in uh, a vast region along the northern Chile uh, between, for example, Antofagasta here and uh, Arica here. So in spite of this, we have uh, archaeological records showing that communities were um, developing strategies to, to live in this extreme environment since at least the last 12,000 years. Uh, we have some uh, beautiful pictures like this and also um, archaeological records showing these um, living strategies. Uh, from a geomorphological point of view, we have uh, marine terraces that uh, evidence the uplifting history, quaternary history of this uh, region. And also we have a historical earthquake, subduction earthquake, uh, nucleated um, along the interplate contact between the Nazca beneath the South American plate. And uh, in this we have, for example, the last earthquake, 18, 1868 and 1877, um, which are supposed to, to be 8.6 and 8.8 uh, in magnitude. Um, some some uh, pictures showing the dramatic impact of this earthquake uh, are shown in this slide regarding the 1868 earthquake in Arica, and also this slide showing the impact of the 1877 earthquake along northern Chile. Uh, in particular, this slide to the to the left shows the isoseismal contours uh, that were uh, proposed by Edgar Kausel in 1966, showing the epicenter region located between almost Mejillones and Pisagua here. Cobija, which is here in some pictures uh, to the right, is a, is a place, an amazing place in which we have a combination of um, historical record, historical rings, but also some archeological records. And from both kinds of records, we are trying to get some um, paleoseismic and archeoseismic uh, history. This is a picture showing the, the rings at Cobija. This is a picture showing the, uh, a photo from, from the event of night 1877, uh, which with a tsunami that reaches about uh, 20 meters above the sea level, 
at this area. And this is the kind of record that uh, we, are, we are studying at and we propose to see in the field in November 2021, among others, of course. Um, this is a kind of geoarchaeological study from which uh, we can uh, get some paleo tsunami records among um, shell middens from, from uh, this site. And this is another example of this kind of um, research showing, for example, in, in, in this photograph, the shell midden from Cobija is a shell midden of uh, mid Holocene age. And interpreted between the archaeological record, we have some uh, anomalous or distinctive layers that we are interpreting as uh, paleo tsunami records from which we get some ages like uh, 13th century and also 15th century uh, paleo tsunami episodes. In addition to that, we have also some beautiful deposits. For example, this one is located some kilometers to the north from Tocopilla, uh, to the north of Cobija, in, in, in the middle of this region, in fact. And this deposit is embedded in, in uh, archaeological shell midden, from which we get, uh, we got ages about uh, 3,800 cold years, cold years BP mid Holocene to late Holocene, in fact. And uh, we are interpreting a, a huge event that occurred about this, this date. Uh, had, as you can see here, this deposit is located at about 16 meters above the sea level, above the modern sea level. And in addition, we can see here in this picture, in this photo, a beautiful, beautiful um, uplift uh, littoral deposits in, from which we can, we can get also an uplifting history, which is Holocene, in fact, that evidence the, the importance of the tectonic processes in this region. For example, here in the, in the photo to the left, we see the deposit reaching up to uh, seven meters above the sea level, in which the littoral deposit reached about uh, six meters above the sea level. Um, so we interpret that this is the product of uh, huge events, um, probably has higher, has the historical ones, but also maybe um, greater than those events. Um, now, some intraplate, other plate faulting history from Gabriel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Can you put in, in presentation mode because you are in the slide mode? Um, really? Yes, yes, really. Oh. <laughs> you have to put in presentation mode. No, no, we go, go further just to put in presentation mode. You are in the... In... Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. we're in your um, presenter view, Gabriel. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. That's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, I would like to say hello, everybody. Um, okay. I will, uh, would like to give a uh, very short overview about the upper play fault in, in northern Chile. Uh, this, uh, the map show the region from Mejillones to Arica. Uh, you can distinguish with black lines the upper plate forts, uh, which has uh, had uh, uh, expression in the morphology. Um, well, one important thing here in the northern Chile does, uh, is that uh, right in the northernmost part, uh, close to Iquique, where the 2014 earthquake uh, occurred, uh, most of the upper plate are very oblique to the trench and trench orthogonal void. And I put some focal mechanisms of the past earthquake in the area, and you can see there is a very uh, nice uh, um, trench uh, parallel shortening. Uh, the picture shows the Kiki city in the, in, the, in the right corner up is the Kiki city. You can see uh, some lines. This line represents 
uh, reverse fold, is west uh, trend in reverse fold. Uh, a very nice uh, exposure of this re uh, reverse fold is in the middle. This is a, a, a Bakomoye fold, which is the southernmost part of Iquique. Uh, this is a, a, a view to the to the east, and you can see here uh, the undertrust of Mesozoic volcanic uh, in above um, uh, sedimentary marine sedimentary deposit of Lake Place to say. And then below uh, we have a, a very nice um, uh, exposition of a strike slip fold, an offset of six meter. This is a this the Tomate fold, which is an oblique fold. I, I can I don't know. If you can see my 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 pointer, but it's it's located uh, where this start a red start here. There is an oblique fold, no west uh, trending. Okay, uh, the next place, uh, just to Gabriel, the next place. Okay, Gab are you there, Gabriel? Can you put uh, go further with the next? It, it is already okay. Good. Okay, just to show you uh, something about the earthquake in the area, uh, here I show you, uh, this is the real law. What is, okay, Gabriel, you have okay. to put it. Okay, okay. Okay, but uh, this is the, uh, in the, in the right, uh, in the left corner, uh, you can see a map uh, with, uh, the earthquake that has been uh, detected from 2010-2012 is our, or our upper plate earthquake and show the nose hole shortness very, very well uh, expressed. There is some strike slip along two fold, which is the Solar Grande fold. In the left map, you can see STF fold running. Can you show the the ST fold? Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the Tomate fold. Um, during September this year, we had uh, NW 6.3 earthquake. This was an upper plate earthquake in, close to the Rio Loa. You can see the, uh, the red dot and show the um, epicenter and then, and then the aftershocks. Uh, all are very good alignation. Uh, and then you see in the figure where the lot of focal mechanism <laughs> is, uh, you can see very well the main uh, choke and then the after the after choke uh, showing the this uh, uh, so shortening. The next slide, uh, please, Gabriel. And then we go further to the south to uh, the area of Mejillones. Uh, and here near, you can see uh, down in the map uh, the. Mejillones Peninsula, uh, Peninsula uh, and there is the place of the Atacama Fall Zone. Uh, you, uh, what you see in, in the area in the photo on the right side is the beautiful scarp of the Mejillones Fault. Uh, you can see in the digital elevation model in the uh, right side uh, in the red line show the Mejillones fault uh, and here is a trench that we uh, uh, excavate in this uh, fault and it's very nice exposure of this fault and some colluvial wedge that we are uh, dating uh, and we have some age. Uh, some of these trenches are still remaining probably we can clean at the time when we organize the Patadays field trip uh, sure we will visit this area. Just to show, probably, Gabriel, can you show where is Ornitos located, the venue of the place uh, of the Pata days? Uh, or oh, you go back, go, uh, okay, there is the uh, Ornitos uh, area where uh, we, the venue will take place. And then it's very close to Mejillones Peninsula and we can visit all of these wonderful uh, uh, places. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, and finally, the next uh, slide. Oh, here is the uh, overview of the poly seismology of the Atacama fault system. Uh, this is the main scarp. Uh, it's a composite fault scarp. There is 12 trenches excavated here. I show you this, uh, one of the examples of these trenches. 
Uh, these trenches are, are still open. Uh, we are planning to, uh, to clean by the time of the field trip in November 2021. And the last uh, slide, please, uh, Gabriel. Uh, finally, I would like to show you uh, the Mejillones Peninsula, which is the, uh, a very good uh, place to see marine terraces, deformed by marine terraces, normal fault, uplifted, uh, bit riches. Uh, uh, all of these coral represent uh, the main uh, marine terraces. Uh, I just we go very fast to some picture of the area of the Mejillones Peninsula. Uh, the next, uh, Gabriel, please. Um, here is an overview uh, about this uplifting marine terraces. Uh, what you see uh, in the background is uh, the Orquinos Fort on the Caleta Radura Fort, and uh, the beautiful rollover structure is possible to distinguish with this white color in, in the photograph. Uh, uh, and, then you, and then you can see very flat surface, which are uh, uplifting marine terraces. The, the next one, please. Uh, very, Okay, uh, this is a fault plane in the form in marine uh, terraces. And the next one, uh, go further. And just to uh, the last slide is, okay, this is a uh, fault in marine terraces in the Mejillones Peninsula. And this is a nice picture of the governing field where is uh, good preservation and normal fault. Um, finally, 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 go further, Gabriel, please. Um, okay, there's the Mejillones Pool, also at the beaches. Uh, and the, uh, the next place, uh, all of this wonderful fall exposition, you can enjoy the next in the field trip uh, the next year. Uh, and here is the Mejillones Fall uh, Trench, uh, where it is possible to see the fall plane and the, the jungle's uh, sediment uh, slope deposit or deformed by this fault. Okay, and then we go to, I left to Cristina Ortega. Uh, please go to present the short abstract digital volume, which is available yeah. in, the, in, the, in the Pata Day's uh, uh, homepage. Okay. Yeah, Gabriel, thank you. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, well, I can tell you uh, in this first, uh, in this link, Patadays Chile uh, points here, uh, you can see a book uh, conformed with 75 very interesting uh, tour abstract uh, from diverse uh, parts of the world, uh, a lot of countries, a lot of a research group in, in this abstract, in, in these works. Um, in there, you can see different topics, active tectonics, landslides, surface faulting, paleoseismology, uh, tsunami and paleo-tsunami works, among others. So uh, you, I, I want to invite you uh, to, to see the, this, uh, these works. And also, I want to invite, I invite you to uh, to, to leave the, the next uh, meeting in our country, as you see in the in the before in the previous uh, photos, uh, that will be a, a this is a very nice place. It's a beautiful place to study the tectonics. So uh, there is uh, 20 places available uh, still. So uh, we want to invite you and to leave this these fields and this meeting in 2021. Thank you. Okay, uh, right now we go to invite the lecturer. Let me introduce uh, our key speaker, Thomas, Thomas Rockwell. Uh, he will present some advancement in paleoseismology, a seismic hazard uh, from fault architecture. Um, uh, Thomas is an international renowned in paleoseismology and structural geology uh, who has published uh, hundreds of articles. Uh, he, he, he was the leader uh, geology, uh, 
the geology group leader for the Southern California Earthquake Center uh, for many years. He is an expert on tectonics and earthquake hazard of Southern California and Baja California. Uh, Tom has conducted extensive trenches program to date earthquake uh, on faults uh, in different country. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, this is your time to give this uh, talk. Okay. Please. Well, hello everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I hope there's not a big delay. Um, and hopefully, can you see the screen now? Yes. I'm wondering how long it will take between my computer and everyone else's. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, we see. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to give you a talk that's uh, not paleo seismology per se, but it's more structural geology of uh, fault zones. And then at, towards the end, relate it back to paleo seismology. And mainly, I want to develop some ideas that uh, probably many people have been exposed to, and that is what do uh, fault damage zones and architecture of fault zones tell us about things like fault rupture direction. Uh, can we pull information out of fault zones that give us additional information that we can use in paleo seismology? So uh, why do we study damage zones? Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons, uh, not just for paleo seismology, but uh, they're a sink for earthquake energy. They provide long-term fluid pathways uh, in the damage zones. Uh, and in those pathways, you can get deposition of ore, um, fossil fuels, heat transfer, and whatnot. Uh, they provide information on the rupture process, and, and in particular, later on, I'll talk about preferred rupture directions, uh, if we can pull that signal fault zones. Uh, and one of the reasons this is really important is because uh, many of you may be aware of directivity effects, but if a a long strikes at fault ruptures in one direction versus the other, it can certainly impact the uh, amount of strong ground motions, uh, especially in the direction of the rupture. And also we may have information on uh, MMAX, which is important from um, seismic hazard studies. And then of course, of course the role of fluids in fault zones, uh, and they, uh, which infect uh, or influence frictional processes and uh, then many of these uh, faults may accommodate creep uh, or post seismic creep, post seismic slip. So um, the field areas that I'll talk about through this talk are mainly from Southern California. These are areas that over the last 15 years or so, we've been doing very detailed and extensive studies on the architecture of the faults, as well as uh, extensive geochemical analysis of the fault zone and the wall rock and looking at uh, the transfer of mass from the fault core out into the wall rock and then also the associated damage that's related to seismic energy. So I'll start with the San Andreas fault and then we'll go to the San Jacinto and then down into Mexico. So one of the motivations uh, for these studies was some early theoretical work by Yuhre Benzion, who is now the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. And in his modeling, he showed that if you have a velocity contrast or a compliance contrast across the fault, it should favor propagation in one direction and it should inhibit propagation in the other direction. And uh, back around almost 20 years ago, I took Yehuda out to some sites that I've been working on the San Jacinto Fault and showed that there was a very strong asymmetry in the fault core and in a damage zone around the fault. And uh, he became very excited about this and immediately put to Ori Dor, a PhD student on this project, where we started looking at the damage structure of faults. And uh, in this particular case, uh, it looked like uh, this favored rupture to the northwest. And so we, we looked at the fault zone on many different sections to see if we could pull out a, a, a uniform signal of rupture direction. 
We also started looking at the San Andreas Fault during that time. And there's a broad zone of what uh, some had called gouge. And it turns out uh, this is pulverized granite. Uh, and we mapped pulverized granite along a long section of the San Andreas Fault. And I should probably define what we mean by pulverization because pulverized granite is definitely not gouge. So let's define pulverization. Uh, for pulverized rock, uh, this refers to mainly we see it in crystalline and metamorphic rocks, although we also now have recognized it in uh, Pliocene sandstones and even in uh, incipient pulverization in, in quaternary uh, sandstones or uh, unconsolidated sandstones, in fact. But this is uh, where you get uh, mechanically fractured uh, rock down to the micron scale. And yet you preserve the original fabric of the crystal boundaries. And what's, this, is a, this photomicrograph is a quartz crystal. And uh, the right side is uh, in cross polars. And one thing that we notice right off is uh, when you rotate the stage, um, the quartz crystal, the entire crystal will go extinct at the same time. So uh, right off that told us that uh, there was very little shear in this material. So calling this gouge, gouge by definition, is a product of shear. And what we're finding is that these pulverized rocks uh, ex experience very little shear. And in fact, this next slide, uh, here's some examples of the pulverized uh, Tahone Lookout granite. And again, in the upper right, you can see uh, some uh, quartz crystals that under polarized light, they're all uh, showing extinction at the same time. And in the lower lowermost diagram, that's a plagic clays crystal. And we, uh, based on uh, the twinning, you can see that there's essentially zero shear, zero differential mo uh, movement of the twin planes, but you are getting uh, expansion of the crystal. So you're getting fracturing and a little bit of dilation without any evidence of shear. And this is what we mean by uh, pulverization. So this turns out to be a, a fundamental aspect that we find along the big faults in Southern California and Baja California, where we have zones of pulverization adjacent to uh, the principal shear surfaces. So uh, one thing we are interested in is to what extent is this a result of surface weathering or how much is it affected by surface weathering? And so we drilled a core next to the San Andreas Fault down to about 42 meters depth and we had excellent recovery. Um, across three different rock types, all of which were pulverized. And one thing that was very interesting is that there was essentially no difference from top to bottom. Uh, you had a little bit of weathered material in the upper uh, meter or so, but uh, this is the particle distribution for mean grain size from the surface down to almost 40 meters. And the mean grain size averaged between 50 and uh, 600 microns, um, which is coarser than it was originally proposed uh, by Wilson and others, but it accounts for about 1% of the fracture energy. Uh, fracture, fracture energy accounts for about 1% of the uh, energy budget from dynamic ruptures. And uh, there's very little difference. This is not a, uh, not a signal of weathering or, or surface processes. We attribute this entirely to uh, dynamic shattering during earthquake ruptures. So another study, this is a Rempe et al. study, uh, where we looked at uh, a nice exposure at Little Rock uh, out from uh, the San Andreas Fault. So in this lower left diagram, uh, the main fault is shown in red, and the exposure, which is in the upper right, is this one here, this orange bar, uh, where we could actually get out many tens of meters from the fault. And pulverized granite is very well expressed in this uh, in this exposure. And this is what it looks like going out. Uh, if you go out a half a kilometer, you get into intact granite. Um, and then as you approach the fault core, it uh, becomes uh, more highly fractured. Uh, and then uh, uh, nearer the fault core, you get into pulverized granite. And then right next to the fault core, uh, you see both pulverization and evidence of shear. So uh, and then it becomes cataclastic in the fault core itself. So this is a common, in fact, we see this transition from fresh rock uh, into the fault core 
uh, going from fractured to pulverized to sheared. Uh, we've seen this now in almost every exposure that we worked along the San Jacinto and San Andreas faults. So this is a diagram from that paper uh, that uh, expresses that where you're going from uh, intact granite, fractured granite, pulverized, and then pulverized and sheared uh, next to the fault core. So there's a very common uh, theme you're gonna see uh, in the next few minutes. Um, there's another site uh, near Little Rock where we uh, sampled uh, from at least 400 meters away from the fault into the fault core. And uh, um, again, going from uh, relatively intact rock to thoroughly pulverized rock. And again, here's parent rock is unweathered granite diorite. Uh, then you get into the damage zone, it gets fractured and then pulverized. And again, in this lower diagram, you can see the individual crystals are just completely shattered. Uh, and yet um, in polarized light, they go extinct at the same time. And again, that's telling us there's very little shear in these rocks um, or they would be rotated these fragments would be rotated. Uh, so we see this repeatedly going into the San Andreas Fault. Now, one thing that's really interesting is when you look at particle distribution, um, one thing uh, we see in all of these, of course, the particles are getting smaller and smaller as you approach the fault core, uh, but also porosity is going up. And people think of faults as seals for you know, fluids, which is true, the fault core is a seal for fluid, but uh, what we're finding is that porosities are typically 15 to 20 percent in the damage zone and we found them as high as 30 percent uh, right next to the fault core. Uh, similarly with volumetric strain, uh, we see volumetric strain increase into the fault core. So the characteristics that are, are very common uh, and we're going to use these when we look at asymmetry properties to see if we can tease out information on uh, preferred rupture directions and whatnot. So these are all kind of background information on the kind of characteristics that we look at in fault zone architecture. So here's particle size distribution uh, increasing away from the fault. Um, okay, so here's kind of a generaliza generalization of the damage structure of the San Andreas. Generally, there are broad zones of pulverized granitic rocks extending tens of meters from the fault core. Uh, with increasing porosity and volumetric strain towards the fault core. Uh, pulverization damage is also documented in sandstones adjacent to the San Andreas. Uh, increasing shear adjacent to the fault core, including along many secondary fault uh, or shear surfaces. Um, one interesting thing about Little Rock and one reason we are uh, working there is this is a step over zone between the San Andreas and the Punchbowl Fault which is a fossil strand of the San Andreas. And it is probably the broadest zone of pulverization that we've seen. Uh, pulverization extends out almost 400 meters from the San Andreas Fault. And we attribute this in part to extension uh, within this broad stepover zone. It's a releasing stepover. Now the San Andreas has over 300 kilometers of total slip. So it's got a long history. And how much of this damage occurred at depth versus at the surface? Uh, was an open question. And so we wanted to go to a fault that we had constraints on in terms of its uh, exhumation history. And that would be the San Jacinto Fault. And the reason we know its exhumation history is because in Southern California, there's a broad upland surface at about uh, 1.2 to 1.3 kilometers elevation, um, which is tertiary in age. And that's significant because the San Jacinto and other faults to the west of the San Andreas are entirely quaternary, quaternary in age. And so we know um, based on uh, the depth of our various studies, how far they are below this uh, tertiary weathering surface. Um, we know the depth of exhumation of the fault itself. So I mean, we know this is tertiary because we have Eocene gravels and Miocene deposits on the surface. And we had Eocene rivers that flowed across this from Sonora, Mexico to the coast back in Eocene time. So at that time, there was essentially no relief along the California coast. And all the coast range uplift has occurred in the last five or six million years. So uh, this first place I'll show you is called Horse Canyon. 
and the tertiary erosion surface is about three to 400 meters above the fault exposure. Uh, fault is nicely shown here. This is the San Jacinto Fault. I think you can uh, see the red arrow pointing to it, but it's really, really obvious in the geomorphology. And then in the canyon itself, um, there's excellent exposure of the fault um, where the stream has cut across the fault core and the damage zone. And in this area, it juxtaposes two tonalite plutons, the Horse Canyon pluton and Cuya Valley pluton. And uh, we uh, have sampled out from the fault core on both sides of the fault. Now, both of these plutons are true tonalites. There's very little case bar in them. Uh, this is, these are point counts on uh, this, uh, quartz plage uh, case bar ternary diagram. And uh, you can see that there's generally less than 5% uh, case bar in these, in these plutonic rocks. Okay, so here's a, a photomicrograph of the Horse Canyon Pluton. Here's one of the Cuya Valley Pluton. They're a little different. They're very similar though in their geochemistry. And, um, and in both of these cases, you can see there's essentially zero fracturing uh, out in the wall rock away from the damage zone. So this is an example of the fault core exposed in the stream bed. Uh, to the left is pulverized granite or pulverized tonalite really. The fault core itself is less than half a meter in width and it has a two centimeter wide gouge zone which represents the modern um, slip surface. And the fault core is principally a ultra cataclysite, uh, which is silicate enriched and hard as a rock. So in fact, uh, we first took samples of this back. Uh, I showed them to one of my colleagues, Gary Gurdy, and he goes, where did you get the basalt? Because it looked like uh, it was aphanitic and it looked like a dark black basalt. And in thin section, it has a very glassy texture to it, uh, or it's mostly extinct or, or opaque. Um, in any case, the entire 25 kilometers of slip on the San Jacinto Fault is contained within this narrow zone here. So in a half a meter wide zone, we have 25 kilometers of strike slip. And with the principal slip surface being uh, less than two centimeters in width. So we sampled out a number of uh, uh, samples, as you can see here, uh, from the fault core out into the damage zone and extending out many meters. Um, this is extending out into all the way out into the wall rock where it became fractured but not pulverized. And uh, this is a generalized architecture of that one exposure where you have the, the fault core and the damage zone extending out about nine meters on the southwest side and a few meters onto the northwest into the Horse Canyon Pluton. And um, much of the uh, deformation in the fault in the damage zone is pulverization out several meters and you also have these micro uh, breccia seams that um, we analyzed for geochemistry which I'll show later on uh, but you have this uh, transition zone damage zone and then out into the fresh rock so there's a fairly typical uh, type of exposure along the San Jacinto it's narrower than the San Andreas but that's to be expected because there's far less slip on the San Jacinto Fault than the San Andreas. The San Andreas has more than 10 times the amount of strike slip as the San Jacinto. So here are some rock textures again, going uh, from the unweathered uh, and uh, unfractured wall rock, very nice uh, tonalite fabric, uh, into fractured rock, into pulverized, and, and then into the fault core itself. And in the fault core, uh, the tonalite has been reduced primarily to rounded fragments of quartz and feldspar. Grain sizes are very fine from about 0.2 millimeters down to uh, 0.01 millimeters in diameter. And one thing that was very interesting in the fault core is that the, all the grains show this rounded texture. And we looked at these with an SEM and you can see that they're just fractured off on the edges. So individual quartz grains that are still preserved um, have been sheared and rotated. Um, <clears throat> and then the ground mass uh, has this ultra cataclastic texture to it. Okay, so here's more uh, photo micrographs. Uh, the upper left is the pulverized granite or tonalite. 
And this looks like rock, but I guarantee you, you can take this and crush it in your fingers uh, to a powder. And that's kind of the, uh, the characteristic of pulverized rock. You can literally play Superman with it, take it in your hand and crush it to a powder. Um, and in thin section, uh, this is thin section of, uh, on the lower left. Again, you have this jigsaw texture, uh, texture uh, in quartz grains that all go extinct at the same time. Um, and one thing we found here was injection of gouge matrix in between the fragments of quartz. So you didn't have any rotation of the quartz, uh, individual fragments, but you do see uh, dilation and injection of gouge into uh, the open fractures. In the transition zone, there's much more evidence of shear. I think this is obvious just looking at it at, uh, uh, in the field in the upper left. You can see a lot of shear fabric in the samples. And in the lower left, you can see you're transitioning to uh, it's a uh, cataclysite. And there's uh, definite foliations that you can, you can observe in thin section and in the field. And then in the fault core itself, here you have um, fragments of recycled cataclysite and you have the ultracataclysite ultra uh, fault core, um, which was less than a half a meter in thickness, this whole, the whole fault core which is, in my mind, quite thin for 25 kilometers of uh, total slip. Okay, so that was fairly typical of what we saw along the San Jacinto Fault. Uh, this last one is along the 2010 rupture down in uh, Baja, California. This is along the Borrego Fault uh, in the uh, Sierra Cucapa. And the Borrego Fault has uh, about six to eight kilometers of total slip, so it's much less than the San Jacinto. It's oblique. It's dominantly strike slip, but it has a normal component of slip. It hosted the magnitude 7.2 earthquake in 2010 with about four meters of oblique slip in this area. Um, and uh, maximum dip slip is about 4.3 kilometers. So there has been quite a bit of uplift on it. Um, this is the rupture from 2010. And I think you can see that very nicely from the upper left of the I mean, the upper right to the lower left. Um, what's interesting about the 2010 earthquake is it produced, uh, it was on an anathetic fault to the Laguna Salada, and it produced mountainside down uh, overall deformation. So it's a northeast facing, uh, uphill facing scarp. And the consequence that, of that is it, it is trapping sediment. So from paleoseismology, we know that it uh, has trapped sediment in the past from past earthquakes has a recurrence interval of about 10,000 years. So this is a relatively rare event. Uh, but in 2013, we had a 100-year storm come through. And it not only backfilled much of the scarp, but it overtopped the scarp with water. And it basically flushed out and cleaned off alluvium for about 50 meters of the damage zone. And we were able to then have a pristine exposure uh, of the damage zone extending out for tens of meters from the fault core. So this is, uh, this is a, a drone, very low altitude, probably flown at five meters um, uh, mosaic in the lower part of this uh, image here, uh, showing this platform that was cleared off by, uh, by this one storm. And we sampled uh, this from the fault core out to um, 52 meters from the fault core. And again, when you get into the parent rock, it's a, it's a tonalite. So it's a tonalite going to granodiorite. Uh, it's uh, very low in case bar, but uh, fairly rich in quartz. And in the fault core itself, uh, we, we, <laughs> we collected the entire fault core. It was about two meters wide. And we basically epoxied uh, the entire thing in a column and hauled it out of the field and across the border. It was about um, 150 kilograms in weight. Um, and then took thin sections across the entire fault core so that we have the entire fault core characterized. One thing that was a little disappointing is that most of the fault core was carbonate, which was the hanging wall rock. And there was only a little uh, part of it that was uh, derived from the tonalite side. 
uh, on a fossil uh, fault core. Um, but uh, this is what you see in the lower part. And again, uh, you have uh, cataclasite to ultra cataclasite in the fault core. Um, the damaged textures are again pulverization and to uh, intense brecciation out from the fault core. And so you're getting, again, uh, grain size reduction right to the fault core. This is a paper that we, one of my master's students, uh, which is currently in press. And um, so these are the typical damage structure or the damage characteristics and textures that you see out from in the damage zone. Uh, this is a, a complementary study that uh, Giles Ostermeyer and all uh, we did looking at the fracture density as you go out from the fault core. One thing we've noticed for a long time is that even in these pulverized zones, we see fragments of non-pulverized rock. And, and in this particular diagram, he, uh, he uh, characterized the fractures at very detailed uh, scale and then basically summed them all up. And what we see here is heterogeneity in the damage distribution. Uh, it's very easy to selectively collect polarized samples as opposed to non-polarized uh, in the field. Uh, in this case, we're, what we're, we're particularly interested in is how homogenous was the polarization. And it turns out it's not that homogenous at all. Um, it's very clear to see the heter heterogeneity of the damage. And we think this is pretty typical of what we're seeing along all of the faults that we've studied so far. Okay, so how do you produce pulverization? Uh, there have been a number of laboratory studies that have used a split Hopkinson pressure bar uh, to produce pulverization. And uh, this particular one by Aben and all, um, they required higher strain rates. So if you get below a certain strain rate threshold, you get fracturing, but you don't get full pulverization. So in these cases, they have a, a striker and an input bar and you put your sample between them. And then you're basically measuring the energy going in and out. And uh, they get uh, basically, you're basically, it's like taking a hammer to a rock bin under very controlled conditions. And so in this case, uh, they found that with various samples that with repeated low strain strikes, it can produce fracturing and they're parallel to the strike direction. But uh, you needed higher strain rates to actually produce the pulverization. And this is significant from a number of perspectives, but uh, for one thing, and I'll come back to this, is in the field, we've noticed, and we've looked at uh, several faults, and we're starting to do some detailed studies on them, along faults that have produced magnitude six and a half earthquakes. We don't see pulverization. In fact, uh, we only see this, this pulverization, this intense in situ shattering on faults that we know have larger earthquakes, magnitude 7.2 and larger is where so far we've seen pulverization. And so we don't really know where that uh, pulverization threshold is in terms of uh, magnitude, but uh, we're starting studies to really try to quantify that. And I think these uh, laboratory experiments are seeing very much the same thing, where it takes a certain uh, strain rate to produce this high intensity fracturing. And this is going to lead into, I think, uh, some quantification of M max. Can we, can we study fault zone structure and the amount of damage in fault zones and come at values uh, that kind of quantify some M max value, or at least a threshold uh, value for M max? It could be quite useful for seismic hazard studies. So in this particular uh, study, they had fragmented and then pulverized. Okay. So Along that line, we went to another site along the San Jacinto Fault called Rockhouse Canyon. And in this area, um, we are particularly interested because the, um, the tonalite on the northeast side, that's the left side of the fault. The fault here is shown as a red dash. And on the left side of the fault is a pulverized tonalite going out uh, several meters from the fault, you know, at least 10 meters. And then when you get out about 50 to 100 meters, you're into completely fresh, uh, unfractured rock. On the other side was Pleistocene alluvial uh, gravels and a Pleistocene alluvial surface that was at about 120 or 130 meters above the canyon. And one thing we didn't expect to see, which I'll show you, 
is that in the lower transect here, we actually see incipient pulverization in the alluvial deposits, which are completely unconsolidated. Uh, we're doing additional studies on this now, but this is something we published uh, in another master's student uh, thesis project about four years ago. So I'll show you the results of this, but uh, this is uh, really quite interesting that uh, because it shows two different signals. So uh, in Rockhouse Canyon, uh, the tonalite away from the fall is your classic unfractured tonalite. And then as you come in, this is about a little over a meter from the, from the fault core, and you see the typical jigsaw puzzle texture or the fractured quartz that all goes extinct at the same time. So there's very little shear uh, shown in the rock. And then you get into uh, the tonal light is 50 centimeters from the core. You're showing uh, more intense pulverization and some shear um, into the rock. Uh, on the other hand, as you go into the uh, alluvial side at 70 centimeters depth, uh, we see very little fracturing, but you get down to 120 centimeters and um, you're getting a fairly recognizable and intense fracturing of the quartz and feldspar. So all these little uh, fractures here are uh, what, we in, what we termed incipient pulverization. Um, and we only saw those we, uh, at 120 centimeters depth, not at 70. So there seems to be a, a, a relationship between confining stress and pulverization, at least in alluvial deposits. Uh, the granitic rocks were pulverized all the way to the surface, which is not surprising at all. Now, what was surprising about the uh, incipient pulverization is that these had a very strongly preferred fracture direction, which is perpendicular to the fault. So uh, in this diagram, you can see the intensity of pulverization or fracturing increasing to the fault core. Uh, so the grain sizes and the number of fractures are increasing. Uh, but this perpendicular, this fracture is developing perpendicular to the fault told us that these were not uh, a result of instantaneous decrease in normal stress, which is one of the primary mechanisms that's been uh, attributed to the development of uh, some pulverized samples where you get fracturing and then you get this expansion, this dilation with injection of gouge seams. In this case, we could very clearly see that this is due to a compressive stress wave. Uh, that was producing the fracturing that was perpendicular. And this was uh, very similar to what we saw with the split Hopkinson bars, whereas low um, strain rates were producing fractures that were perpendicular to the strike direction. You're seeing very much similar things here where the fractures were being produced perpendicular to the fault, uh, the orientation of the fault. So we think this is a direct result of the passing of uh, um, basically the crack tip during dynamic rupture. Okay, so uh, summary of fracture damage on the San Andreas and San Jacinto and Brago faults. Um, very clearly pulverization is a shallow phenomenon. We've demonstrated that with the studies on the San Jacinto that um, we're seeing pulverization in tonalite almost to the surface. And we're seeing pulverization or incipient pulverization in unconsolidated sandstones below about 100 meters depth. Um, the type and extent of damage depends in part on the wall rock material. Um, inner damage zones are both pulverization and shear, and then extending out into pulverization and ultimately into fresh rock. <clears throat> pulverization is not universal, uniformly pervasive, but quite heterogeneous in its distribution. Uh, definitely occurs at very shallow depths, so it can't be attributed solely to a decrease in normal stress during dynamic rupture. And the broadest zones are observed um, along the San Andreas at fossil releasing stepovers. Uh, the damage zone can be up to one to two kilometers and pulverization can extend out almost 400 meters. So these are characteristics that we're seeing that, uh, along many faults, but all of these are faults that have big earthquakes um, and not more moderate like magnitude 6.5 earthquakes. So, the interpretation is that you're getting in-situ fracturing and pulverization produced by high strain rate loading during dynamic rupture. So you have a compressive stress pulse or, or cycling between compression and tension 
uh, is the primary cause of this intense fracturing. And um, releasing steps exacerbate the fracturing resulting in broader zones of polarization. Now, one thing along the San Andreas that we noticed early on, and this was published in the Door 2006 paper, is that there was broader uh, or wider pulverization on one side of the San Andreas than the other. And so one question has been, uh, to what extent can we use this to infer rupture direction on faults? Is this one of the signals that we can possibly use to infer a preferred rupture direction uh, uh, on large strikes at faults? Okay, so here we go. Um, one other aspect that we've done for all the, or many of these studies is to look at the role of fluids and fault zones. And I'll go through this fairly quickly uh, for an example on the San Jacinto fault. Uh, but typically, in addition to uh, the physical uh, aspects of fracturing, we've analyzed for porosity, grain and bulk density, uh, XRD, uh, and then complete chemical analysis, XRF analysis on all samples. And it turns out that fluids are playing a major role uh, in uh, some of the processes going on within the damage zone. So back to Horse Canyon, here's your um, generalized architecture of this particular um, exposure. Um, what we do find for looking at the mineralogy, and this is from point count data going from the wall rock into the fault core, is uh, getting an increasing combination of grains and removal of plagi clays. Or actually uh, can see this uh, dissolution of plagi clays as we approach the fault core. And in the fault core itself, we're getting highly enriched in silica. So the fault core is dominantly silica, and we've basically leached out um, the feldspars and other elements or other minerals from the fault core. And we see that in the chemical analysis as well, where you're getting uh, dissolution or result of dissolution, you're getting. Uh, enrichment of some minerals, uh, predominantly uh, magnesium and uh, uh, manganese and whatnot. And then you get in from that dissolution, you get an elemental loss of aluminum, calcium, sodium, et cetera. And uh, we can see that in the chemistry, not only at this site, we've done many, many sites, but you see a very similar trend uh, as you approach the fault core where you're losing um, elemental mass of certain elements that are related to the dissolution of feldspars uh, and the enrichment of quartz in the fault core. So in terms of uh, the chemical index of alteration, we see a definite trend towards illite, uh, not smectite, which would be more what you'd typically expect in a Mediterranean climate in Southern California, but we're seeing in the fault core going towards illite. And in fact, in some exposure or some um, analyses in the fault core itself at this site, we had crystalline illite. And which crystalline illite, uh, to form it, requires temperatures of about 150 degrees C. So we're, we're seeing elements of uh, increased heat um, right in the fault core. And keep in mind, this exposure can be no deeper than three or 400 meters. So for those of you interested in this whole issue of frictional heat, uh, there's evidence of shallow frictional heat uh, in the San Jacinto Fault, where we have direct evidence of uh, the total possible depth of exhumation of this fault. Uh, this is, uh, again, chemical index of alteration. This is on the southwest transect, again, showing this uh, trend towards illite. Um, in terms of, of uh, this chemical index of alteration, this is showing the values from the wall rock into the fault core. Uh, grain density uh, should be and does remain the same. Bulk density, however, decreases from your typical um, tonalite values around 2.6 to 2.7 uh, into the fault core or into the uh, inner damage zone down to around 2.2. Um, 2. So a major decrease in uh, overall bulk density showing volumetric expansion of the materials near the fault core. And again, the porosity in this particular exposure goes from your low typical granitic values of a few percent up to about 20%. So we're seeing significant increases in porosity at every site that we've studied 
as you approach the fault core. And then the core itself is going to have very low porosity. So you know, this is your typical um, transition. Okay, so Tom, <clears throat> Tom Mitchell is doing permeability studies on, on samples from this exposure. And um, he's finding that your, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're getting, again, permeability increasing, not just porosity, but permeability increasing into the damage zone. And then as you approach the fault core, it goes to very low values. And I think this is quite significant when you think about fluid flow and fault zones, because uh, if you're having an intense increase in per permeability as you approach the fault core, this is, keep in mind, this is several orders of magnitude increase in permeability. And then of course, in the fault core itself, it goes down to very low values, again, similar to the wall rock. All right, so this is increasing pressure. Uh, we see uh, similar values, similar increases uh, with, uh, as you approach the fault core. Okay, and here's the porosity measurements. Okay, so those are the textures, again, as you approach the fault core. You, Increase in fractures, increase in porosity, increase in permeability. Um, volumetric strain, similar values. Okay, so at this site, we have uh, dissolution of plage into and the formation of illite as you approach the uh, fault core, uh, loss of uh, calcium, sodium, and aluminum uh, resulting from the dissolution of the pelagic clays, increase in iron, magnesium, manganese, and potassium or uh, phosphorus. Um, in the fault core along with silica. These are all fluid driven processes and these uh, not only uh, require fluids, they require heat to some degree or another. And then you have, of course, the uh, decrease in grain and bulk density, um, increasing fragmentation of the fault core. And uh, another site that I'm not gonna show you is um, um, an area that has very little exhumation, um, has, uh, only illite smectite, no evidence of heating in the fault core. It's, it's basically at the surface. So this is some of what we're seeing here, we think was occurring at depths of a few hundred meters. They're now incised down to uh, this current uh, exposure, but uh, these are things that were occurring at, at, when this was buried at a few hundred meters depth. Okay, so our generalized model of damage zone evolution uh, call this kind of the fault pump, is you have evolution of fracture damage with repeated ruptures and cumulative offset. Um, one thing I haven't talked about yet or I've mentioned, but uh, we have the general lack of polarization along smaller faults. Uh, as fracture intensity increases, so does porosity and permeability. Uh, pressure cycling during dynamic rupture drives fluids from the core into the damage zone, resulting in mass losses and silicification of the core. Uh, some heat is suggested at shallow depth along the San Jacinto. Um, this may be a function of pressure cycling during dynamic rupture. Uh, it might be shear heating, uh, although because uh, we only see the illite in the fault core itself. Uh, the other possibility is flash heating the hot fluids uh, in this uh, highly permeable um, damage right next to the fault core. And then uh, one thing I didn't go into in depth, but uh, Along the San Andreas, we see extensive chloritization along the San Andreas at Little Rock. And this extends out for tens of meters, maybe a hundred meters. So it's not, a, you can't attribute this to shear heating. Uh, and then one thing we're looking at right now is how much, if we're seeing this chloritization at shallow depth, are we getting hot fluids that flash up the fault right after dynamic rupture? You have open uh, pathways that may allow for uh, superheated fluids from depth because uh, these things, you know, this chloritization, chlorite requires a minimum of 150 degrees C and we're seeing these virtually to the surface. Um, this area is not exhumed more than a kilometer. So we're seeing these at very shallow depths that uh, cannot be attributed to shear heating. Uh, it must be some other mechanism which we're looking at now. Okay, so how does this all relate to paleoseismology? because most of you know me as a paleoseismologist. And what got me interested in this is 
understanding if there's a, um, a signal of rupture direction locked into the damage zone of large faults. And if so, can we identify this consistently and use this information to more completely characterize paleo seismic earthquakes? And, uh, you know, another question, of course, is what about M max? M max is an important character in probabilistic seismic hazard studies. So do certain damage signatures tell us something about the sizes of past earthquakes? And from preliminary work so far, it's looking like you need large earthquakes to produce pulverization. And we're not seeing it on, so far on faults that we know historically have produced moderate earthquakes in the magnitude six to 6.88 range. So we're thinking that the transition where we're starting to see pulverization probably is in somewhere in the high six to magnitude seven kind of range. So if you have faults that don't have pulverization, it says that most of the time they're not producing big earthquakes, not the really super damaging ones. So one thing that led us to uh, look at the uh, fault zone characteristics of the North Anatolia Fault was um, a paper by um, Ross Stein and all, uh, and Aiku Barka and whatnot, that uh, looked at this Anatolian sequence. I'm sure you're all familiar with this unzipping of the North Anatolian Fault started in, started in 1939, you know, John ruptured to the west, and then you had a 1942 magnitude seven in the Nixar Basin, um, which is uh, right in this area, this little blue section here. And then 1943 section was this next 250 kilometers, but it did not nucleate in the area of stress loading. In fact, it nucleated 250 kilometers to the west and ruptured back into the area of the Nixar Basin. And then 1944 nucleated in the same area and ruptured to the west. So one question we had is, is this normal? Um, there were actually, uh, I'll go into this briefly, but um, we wanted to understand if the fault zone recorded uh, this change in rupture direction. Um, and there were experiments by Jim Bruin and his group at UNR uh, using la large foam rubber models that demonstrated that uh, material contrast or compliance led to a preferred rupture direction. So they had these room size uh, foam rubber uh, pieces they had embedded with little seismometers and whatnot. And they would load them from one direction or the other uh, and then mimic uh, rupture on the interface. And they found that if you had a stiffness contrast in the foam rubber, it would always rupture in the same direction no matter which side you loaded it from. So this was a lab experiment which supported the theoretical work of Benzion and Andrews that suggested that a material contrast could and in fact um, lead to a preferred rupture direction. So we wanted to look at the North Anatolian Fault uh, and we studied uh, a bunch of uh, sites all along the 43 and the 44 ruptures where we dug trenches. But instead of digging trenches to look at paleo earthquakes, we dug these trenches in rock to look at the fabric um, structure of the fault zone. And what we found is that along the 1944 rupture, there was far more damage on the north side of the fault than on the south. Then the principal slip surface was localized on the south side of the rupture, on the south side of the damage zone. In the 1943 rupture, there was more damage on the south side. Uh, and the fault core was localized on the north side of the damage zone. And we saw this also in terms of the geomorphology. Uh, this is a, a section let me go back here. Um, yeah, I guess. So this was a section where we had an offset pluton that was on both sides of the fault along the 1944 uh, rupture segment. So we could look at the drainage density and other aspects of the geomorphology. And again, uh, it was reflected very nicely in the geomorphology that uh, the major drainages were concentrated on the north side of the rupture. Um, and uh, much higher drainage density of fracturing, which we attribute to much more dense fracturing on the north side along the 44 section and a similar flip over uh, along the 43 section of the rupture. So in fact, this is along the 1943 section on the south side, which is to the right, you can see the high density of, of rilling, uh, which is pretty typical of what we see in pulverized granites are intensely deformed rocks and 
it was largely uh, void or absent on the, on the north side. So we saw a consistent geomorphic signal and structural signal uh, that suggested that the rupture direction that was observed in 1943 and 44 is pretty much locked into the fault uh, and is due to this velocity contrast, which is now uh, being looked at by Ben Zion's group along the North Anatolian Fault. Okay, why is identifying a preferred rupture direction important? Uh, rupture directions affect strong ground motion through directivity effects. Um, we know in Southern California, we've modeled uh, rupture of the San Andreas Fault that a south to north rupture, if we nucleate an earthquake down in the Salton Trough and rupture it towards LA, we have far stronger ground motions in Los Angeles uh, basin because we channel that energy into the basin. Um, then if we rupture uh, from up near Parkfield and we come to the south. So it turns out that directivity can be a big effect because uh, as you rupture in one direction, you're stacking your S waves and you get a stronger uh, pulse uh, than if you're rupturing away from uh, some site. So the directivity is a significant aspect. And then also combining with paleoseismic studies, can we provide better constraints on the extent of past ruptures uh, based on both paleoseismology and historical, uh, early historical earthquakes? Um, may explain why some historical earthquakes seem underreported. Damage is less if rupture propagates away from an historically you know, recording source. I'm thinking right now of the Dead Sea Fault where um, maybe we can combine um, preferred rupture directions with, to explain some of the uh, damage patterns for some earthquakes like 749 or, or the 1202 earthquake, uh, which um, I don't want to go into details, but there, there's probably elements here which could be um, improved upon in terms of our understanding of early historical earthquakes. And also we may be able to establish likely nucleation zones for pre-instrumental earthquakes, uh, which may be important in testing early historical earthquake damage against likely rupture zone, rupture zone extent. So um, the last thing I mentioned a couple times, do damage zones provide information about the sizes of past earthquakes? Uh, this is ongoing stuff we're looking at. Uh, uh, we don't see uh, the extent of damage on earthquakes, historically, um, historical earthquakes in Southern California uh, that have maximum magnitudes of around 6.6 .6 along uh, the southernmost part of the San Jacinto Fault. Um, we do see it on larger earthquakes. So we're wondering if there's a threshold of damage where you need a certain strain rate before you get pulverization as you see in laboratory experiments. So can we use these fault zone architecture and damage characteristics to better characterize NMAX, uh, or at least the likely maximum size of future earthquakes on faults uh, near critical facilities? So this is ongoing work, so stay tuned. Hopefully I'll give a talk at some point on this at a uh, future Pata Days. All right, thank you very much. That is it. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for this nice talk and interesting talk. Uh, yes, we have uh, some uh, minute to ask uh, some question. Uh, we received some question here in the chat. Please, Alex Chasipit, Petros asks something. Uh, can you, uh, Alex, direct uh, Tom? Yes, hi, everybody. Thank you, Tom, for your very interesting talk. Um, just a question. Um, is the presence of uh, shallow pulverized granites or plutonites an indication of uh, strong earthquakes along the fold, even if we don't have any other um, indications or current seismicity? Because I have in mind uh, specific, uh, a specific area with a large fold with no uh, current or recent seismicity, but um, there is this kind of differentiation of uh, uh, polarization uh, along the fold, uh, across the fold, sorry. And yeah, it we, is, uh, yeah. We're, our current thinking is that this is a direct indication of large earthquakes, but you can also see this on fossil faults. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your fault is active. It just means that in the past it has hosted large earthquakes. I should also point out if you're if you're looking at a large strike slip fault that has no seismicity, the San Andreas Fault in Southern California is a good example of that. This has been known for 
over 50 years, Clarence Allen, in his uh, closing address as SSA president, noticed that if you use the B value for the San Andreas Fault, um, the recurrence interval would be 18,000 years. Um, <laughs> and obviously that wasn't correct. So it's a very quiet fault and fully coupled faults tend to be very quiet seismically. So what I would do is rely more on the geomorphology uh, than the rate of seismicity. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. We have uh, several questions in the chat. Uh, somebody please can ask you directly to Tom. Tom, uh, I have one question. Uh, like uh, most of the case studies you presented here, nicely false. So can we uh, apply this approach for big strip uh, for like normal fault or thrust fault? Yeah, so it's long been known that thrust faults have an increase in fracture density as you get close to the fault. Um, I've not worked on any thrust fault that I've seen pulverization on, um, but uh, we do on some of the um, faults down in Baja, California that are oblique normal, we see pulverization, but it's not as well developed as along purely strikes at faults. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer that. I think uh, one reason I wanted to give this talk is to open up this field to people who haven't been exposed to fault zone architectural issues and that aspect of structural geology. So you can start looking for these things. Um, I, we know that uh, they occur along faults in Japan. I've seen pulverization of granitic rocks, um, faults in Armenia. Uh, so I think this is a very widespread phenomena, uh, but it's also not been well described um, at that many areas. It's a fairly new topic. So now you guys are all aware of it. You can start looking for evidence for pulverization. Thank you. Okay, Koji Okumura has some question. Please ask directly to Tom. Yes. Uh, your San Yashinto site shows very distinctive asymmetry. How do you interpret that asymmetry in your site? Are you referring to the North Anatolian Fault? No, 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 San Jacinto. Oh, San Jacinto. So yes. we see along portions of the San Jacinto a clear asymmetry which flips uh, around an area that's a trifurcation where the fault splays into three strands. And it flips. To the, mm -hmm. Yeah, it flips. So to the northwest, it's asymmetric, more damage on uh, one side of the fault. And then to the southeast, it's more damage on the other. And we attribute this, we think, and I should preface to say that the last earthquake that ruptured this section of the fault was in November of 1800. And no one was there to uh, record it. So we have no idea where it actually nucleated. But our interpretation is probably in this area, the trifurcation of these faults, uh, we suspect that the nucleation of these larger earthquakes, magnitude 7.3 size earthquakes, occurs in this area and then ruptures bilaterally, uh, so that the signature that we're seeing is a function of bilateral rupture. Yep, that's interesting. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stefan Baisi, you can ask. Hello, Tom, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question about the maximum magnitude you are deriving from the level of damage basically on the, the fault zone. Don't you think it could be as well uh, uh, dependent on the depth of nucleation? Because um, well, we, we have the, the project in front of the, the nucleation area. It, it was a very shallow earthquake last year. We want to drill this nucleation area in a further project and this is basically the, the purpose of the study is to study the, the core zone. So if, uh, you know, we don't know the maximum magnitude on that fault yet, but we would like to, to do so. So I'm not sure I totally understand your question, but uh, what we're finding is all along the big faults, we're seeing this type of damage. 
Uh, and yet along smaller faults like the 1968 rupture uh, on, and uh, 87 ruptures on the Southern San Jacinto Fault, we're not seeing pulverization. And uh, even where we have um, rocks you know, to within centimeters of the uh, exposed right up to the fault surface, uh, we're just starting to collect samples and we're going to characterize these in terms of their uh, micro damage that we may be able to see in thin section that we don't <clears throat> don't see an outcrop, but there's a clear difference between uh, the damage signature of faults that we know produce large earthquakes and those that we have so far only seen smaller earthquakes on. So this is a study we've just started this year uh, to start looking at a lot of smaller faults and see if there's a clear separation between the damage signatures of big faults and smaller faults. So um, I'm not sure I can answer your question right now, Stefan, but definitely when you drill it, when you drill this fault, um, I would love to see uh, samples, I'd love to see thin sections um, from the wall rock right into the fault core. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for uh, some <coughs> question. Gala is also asking, please uh, go directly to ask uh, Professor Rockwell, please. Hello? Oh, there is no uh, question. I, I have another one, maybe. About, can, I, can I ask another one question? Yeah, yes, Stefan? of course. Yes. Uh, for the, the Turkey example, you have, you have um, inferred the directivity. Did you observe any kind of um, curved silicon lines that, the, that, like the one that we observed after the, after the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake? I don't recall any curved silicon lines. Um, so I can't answer that. I mean, I, I can't tell you whether they occurred or not, but I did not observe any. Oh, Gabriel, can I ask Tom something? Okay, hey, Tom. Hey, hey, Tom. Um, uh, so I, I wonder if uh, what, what do you think would be the possible dependence on site-specific characteristics on how you get the pulverization of the rocks? I'm, I mean, like weathering, for example, soil development. You, you mentioned that soil wasn't probably the, the cause of what you were observing, but they, I'm, I'm wondering if there might be some positive um, uh, feedback loops between the weather, uh, the fluids that are coming into the fold as well, and and the, the magnitude of earthquakes, and also the composition of the rocks that are being pulverized. So, so in that case, I, 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 it sounds very logic that the larger the earthquake, the more damage, or there's going, there are going to be some signatures that are going to be able, to, maybe we, we, can, we can capture on the geologic record. But then, but then my question is that, um, how much do you think, I, I know this is a, a very, um, uh, it's a seminar, it's a just a, a study that is in, in the very beginning, uh, but then how much those other factors might be very important as well in the signature that you are observing in the rocks? That's, that's my question, thanks. Yeah, so we don't think weathering has much to do with it because this is one of the reasons that we've drilled the San Jacinto or the San Andreas. Um, we wanted specifically to look and see to what degree weathering was a factor and it turned out to be not a factor at all. Um, no matter uh, where we see these rocks that are pulverized, I mean, they occur all along the San Andreas from Tejon Pass to Cajon Pass, which is the area that we've looked at so far. And we've also seen it in every study we've done along the San Jacinto. So I don't think it's a localized phenomena. I think it's more characteristic of the size of ruptures. Oh, look who just joined me here. <laughs> <laughs> he just woke up. Um, obviously, there's many, many more studies that need to be done in terms of uh, how deep polarization extends. 
uh, one thing along the San Andreas I did not talk about was um, we see very clear evidence of high, uh, high intensity fracturing that gets healed. So uh, we see a, a zone of pink feldspar along the San Andreas, um, which uh, in terms of the chemistry of the feldspar, these, these are potassium feldspars. Uh, there's uh, no increase in iron, uh, but you're getting oxidation of the iron. You, you know, potassium feldspar has uh, iron, which is in a reduced state. To turn them pink, they have to fracture and then be healed. So you have to oxidize the iron. And then we see clear evidence of healed fracture traces. So we know that the fracturing is occurring also at depth. And there's been on the order of a kilometer, kilometer and a half maybe of exhumation of these rocks. This is total exhumation. So um, we're seeing evidence of fracturing at depth, healing, and then uh, bringing to the surface. And then over the top of this, we're getting refracturing this intense pulverization right at the surface. So I think this phenomena occurs uh, for you know, extending from the surface down to some depth. Uh, we don't know how deep, uh, but these are, these are ongoing uh, questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Last question. The last question is uh, by Steve Benowski, please. Go ahead. Hi, Tom. Hey, Stephen. It was really a pleasure to listen to you uh, condense all that work you've done over the last few years. Thanks. I, I actually learned a lot. I, I have a question. Uh, have you designed your experiment or have you thought about designing an experiment to uh, remove the uh, possibility that uh, a lot of this is related to cumulative slip in terms of your, your correlation of damage zones to little earthquakes and big earthquakes? Yeah, so um, there's no doubt there's a, there's a signature of cumulative slip. The damage zone is much broader on the San Andreas. Um, however, that said, uh, we see pulverization along, for instance, the Brago Fault, faults that have only a few kilometers of slip, um, and we know it can host larger earthquakes. Uh, elements of the southern San Jacinto have five to 20 kilometers of displacement, which are on the order of magnitude that we see farther north. But Superstition Hills earthquake in the sandstones abutting the fault, there's no observable surface damage. And this is something we're uh, planning to collect samples from this winter, if I'm allowed to go into the field again. Um, so we'll see. I, I don't know the answer to that, Steve. But we do know that at least at, at a first glance, there's obvious expression of damage that's very recognizable along sections of fault that produce big earthquakes. And there's an obvious lack of damage that's observable on the more moderate earthquakes. So give me another year or three. Uh, fascinating, that. yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a Still one question from Koji Okomura, please. Koji, the last, the last, the last. <laughs> uh, you are muted. Koji, you're muted. Okay. No, I think that it's a problem because it's not a PR muted. Uh, is, uh, uh, the question is in the chat. Uh, the question is, how good is your, estima your estimate of temperature during rupture? Is around... Yep. Yes, I'm okay. asking it because some TL researcher claims the temperature reaches 350 degrees at surface to leave TL signals. But your estimate is much lower than that. Right, so uh, we have at a number of sites, I, in fact, some stuff I did not discuss um, along the Laguna Salada Fault, we find pseudotacolite uh, and extensive chlorotization. And that's coming from only no more than a few kilometers depth. But we also have very high heat flow in that area. There's a thermal plume. Uh, we're at the surface. When I've dug soil pits into alluvial fan, 
that was devoid of veg vegetation. We figured out why it was devoid of vegetation because we measured temperatures of 70 degrees centigrade at one meter depth. So we know that there's a, you know, high uh, temperatures coming up on a thermal plume along the fault. But that said, um, we have limits to um, how high the temperature likely is based on the mineralogy. If we know that in at Horse Canyon, where we're forming crystalline Li, we probably have reached 150 degrees, but we don't see chloride. We don't see any chloritization. So, you know, temperatures are 300 degrees. We should see extensive chloritization, which we do see along the Borrego and Laguna Salada faults. We also know uh, from that there's a, a very strong thermal signature in that area. Um, so I'm not sure if I can answer that, but in all of this, in fact, in every study we've done so far, um, we have some control on uh, what minerals are forming and what are not. And we see the cortization along uh, the San, uh, San Andreas Fault, but in an area that uh, also probably has come up one or two kilometers. Uh, that said, it does tell you that at fairly shallow depth, we're seeing um, heat, evidence of heat, but it can't be frictional heat because as you know from drilling uh, to Hoku and other studies, that frictional heat dissipates very quickly and leaves a small signature. Uh, whereas the chloridization we're seeing extends out tens to hundred meters. So this is a very broad signal. Um, it's related, we think, to a thermal plume that has to uh, be related to very rapid um, hot fluids coming up um, probably immediately after the earthquake um, or something like that because we're uh, we cannot attribute this to frictional heat okay thank you, thank you. Uh, there is the last question gregory please go ahead with your question <laughs> the last of the last <laughs> the last of the last hey tom great talk i just had two quick questions uh one of you guys done any fluid inclusion work to differentiate between shear heating and flash heating because we've experimented with it a little bit here and it seems like we can potentially see the difference. And then the second one, do you have a rule of thumb on fault length for potential, potentially not seeing pulverization? So is there a length where above this length you tend to see pulverization and below this length there's an absence of pulverization? So thanks. Yeah, so let me answer your second question first. Um, for the faults where we see pulverization, these um, all have rupture lengths that, for instance, the San Jacinto we know is on the order of 100 to 120 kilometers or longer. The San Andreas, of course, can be hundreds of kilometers. Uh, the, the 2010 earthquake ruptured 130 kilometers. Uh, so these are all faults that are, did host and can host large earthquakes. Uh, Superstition Hills, uh, where we don't see pulverization, was uh, about 23 kilometers along the main fault and then a little bit of bleed over on the Weinert fault, so much shorter. Um, the 1968 rupture, again, 20, 25 kilometer lengths, so uh, much shorter length fault, still capable of six and a half, but perhaps not seven and a half. Uh, your first question, fluid inclusion. No, this is something I'd like to start looking at. So if you want me to send you some samples, I'd be happy to have you take a look. Yeah, send them down. Absolutely. <laughs> I have hundreds. We'll communicate. And by the way, awesome. um, most of this work is published or in press or being written up. So uh, if anybody would like papers, I'm happy to send uh, all the ones that are already published. You just email me and I'll send you a clod of, of published work on this topic. Okay. Uh... There is some extended hand there, Bashir. Please, the last, the last, the last, sure. <laughs> okay. Are you getting me? Yes. Yeah, uh, recently we have identified a fault in Kashmir, which is uh, probably, not probably, uh, definitely a thrust fault between Punjab traps and uh, uh, what do you call uh, Holocene sediments. But we have observed this pulverization across the fault for a few centimeters. 
or approximately five, six centimeters. Can we assess the magnitude of the uh, magnitude of the earthquake, past earthquake, to the uh, to the thickness of this polarization, which is approximately six six centimeter, five to six centimeter. Well, that's a really interesting question and one that I've had for some time. And let me preface it by saying that um, we had an earthquake in 1992, the Landers earthquake, which is a 7.3. So up in the class size that you would expect to see polarization. And yet along the rupture, um, we only saw centimeters of pulverized rock right next to the fault surface. Whereas uh, 10, 20 centimeters away, it was crystalline hard rock. So the damage zone was not well developed. Now this fault doesn't have a lot of slip on it. Uh, but the other thing is from the paleo seismology, it turns out that most of the faults that ruptured in 1992 had not ruptured together in the past. They had only been producing smaller earthquakes. So the individual earthquakes on the Homestead Valley or uh, the Emerson. So one question I have had for a long time is, uh, was the 1992 earthquake unusual for the long-term earthquake generation on that system? And it was particularly large and only these large earthquakes produced pulverization and maybe uh, is telling us that most earthquakes aren't that large. So I guess the question would be in your case, uh, perhaps occasionally you have these big earthquakes and maybe on average, uh, most of the earthquakes are smaller. Um, mm -hmm. But to answer that, what you need to do is with paleo seismology, see if you can actually resolve displacement in past earthquakes and uh, see if that's consistent. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for this nice uh, talk. Uh, well, we are at the end of this meeting. I would like to say thank you for being here. It was a great pleasure uh, for us to organize this uh, pre-meeting uh, of the uh, Chile Pata Day. We hope mm -hmm. to see you in November. Uh, the inscription is reopened right now. If uh, somebody is interested to be part of Pata Day, Chile Pata Day, please go to our homepage. Uh, um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year for all. Please keep safe. Uh, we are waiting for you to the next year. Thank you. Thank very you much. very much to everyone. <laughs> Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you, Tom. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you, Gabriel.